Hello, everybody, and welcome back to your Monday chat with our experts. I am Katie Zubow, and I am so excited to be joined by our, by our expert of the of the week, um, although he's much more of an expert weekly, right? David Mattern from Chanticleer Gardens. Welcome, David. Hello. It's good to be here. I'm so excited. So um, we're here today to talk about forcing bulbs. So I think it's a topic some people are a little bit afraid of. It might be something people think is difficult on a scale of one to 10. Okay, it's not you doing it. It's the general, you know, regular gardener. How hard do you think it is? Uh, you know, I think um, it can be very intimidating. I think there's yeah. a lot of gardening techniques can be intimidating, but with like a little basics, a little know-how, you can kind of work it through. So I'll try to cover some of the basics today and gardening, like all things, it just takes practice. So uh, just know failure is part of the learning process. <laughs> yes, it is. I would not, you would not believe how many people have told us that expert gardeners like David have said failure is part of the process. So something like you have to grow, kill a plant three times before you fully know it. I love exactly. that. That's, that's the golden that, rule. <laughs> yes, it's the golden rule. So let me introduce David. So you at Homestead, all of you know and love the garden Chanticleer in Wayne, Pennsylvania. So David is a horticulturist there. His main tasks are the patio, what do you call that? Uh, the Chanticleer terraces. So the terraces. The yep. Yes. So some of my favorite parts of Chanticleer, every part of Chanticleer is wonderful, but the terraces are spectacular. They're little pieces mm -hmm. of something you feel like you could, a small piece of it, create in your own home. And I know that's something that you try to do, you know, help inspire people. Oh, yeah. I like doing lots of little pop pockets, you know, little yeah. moments as you're moving through. There's the grand view, but then there's also these little moments that you come through. So that's the yes. fun stuff. Yeah. Yes. And you also do the vegetable garden, which is a big inspiration. So um, things near and dear to all of our homesteadian hearts. We love vegetables and flowers. So we love that. And you happy new year, I should say to you, right? Yes, exactly. We closed our doors to our guests yesterday. It was the last of our season. And today is the day we start planning for next year. So we open April 1st and next year. And so now is when we're starting to get ready for that. So happy new year, everyone. It's the Chanticleer new year. <laughs> That's so fun. But David and I were talking and I asked him if he gets a break. Um, like most gardeners in the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic, we like to pause in this, in this winter time. Um, and you said, yeah, a little bit, but what do you spend your, your winters really doing? Um, I mean, winter is the time for planning and just making a plan for next year's display, getting all our seed, you know, shopping the seed catalogs. That's the fun stuff. Getting our plans ready for next year. We have a lot of special projects um, in our wood shop and metal shop that a lot of us work on. Um, so anytime you come visit the garden, any of the woodwork or metal work uh, and even most of the stone work is done by us in the garden. So we're doing this over winter time. So it's ready to go when we open so yes it's amazing as david said winter is time for planning so that's what you think about at homestead you can pick up any seeds or bulbs it is not too late to plant your fall bulbs and another fun thing you can do with your fall bulbs is force them so today we're going to talk about david's going to talk about two types of bulbs right david so you i didn't i'd never heard these terms before um so why don't you so that's what we're here to talk about today let us know where you guys are listening from so we can help give you some recommendations recommendations based on your area. If you're not all in that Maryland, Mid-Atlantic area, let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions about forcing bulbs, that's what we're here to talk about. So tell us the difference between something like a amaryllis or something like a, a traditionally fall planted bulb. Sure. Yeah. So I like to kind of group um, bulbs into two different categories, bulbs that go dry dormant. So these are things like your amaryllis, um, that are native to parts of like South Africa um, that go dry dormant during the season. And then um, these are the ones that you're going to use during the holidays. So you're going to start forcing now indoors. And so you have flowering for um, December holidays. So your amaryllis, your paper whites, um, and then all the other bulbs that are uh, what I call winter dormant um, that need a chilling requirement. These are everything else. So these are all your tulips, your daffodils, your crocus, your fritillaries. These are all the things that you're going to pot up. You're going to move um, into a protected location in the winter time. And then the spring, you'll start to see the growth emerge and then you enjoy them in spring. So 
And that's the one I think people, and Kathy is tuning in. She says she thinks the term forcing is maybe what scares people away. We should call it coaxing. I don't know what it is, but. Um, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, but, I think it's more just, uh, you know, just caring, just putting to bed. You know, the bulb's got everything it's need. It needs in, in the bulb itself. So you're just sort of uh, preparing it for its its time to start blooming, really. Well, that's the interesting part. I probably should have brought one and sliced it open because that, well, talk to us about that forcing process. So should we start with um, the, the dry? That's what they're called, right? The dry bulbs? Yeah, and that's yeah. more or less a term I'm using to try to define. Uh, I like so it. The, yeah, good. <laughs> I mean, I mean, understand not everything is is cut and dry. You know, there's there's nuances to everything. But um, yeah, so this is an, an amaryllis. So this is what you're going to use. This is how you're going to find it in the store. You know, you buy it. Yeah, exactly. That's what you get. That's what it's going to get. I just want to make sure in case people are tuning in and you're not necessarily aware of what the amaryllis is. Sometimes people have to see the flower. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is what you start with, and that's what you end up with. <laughs> So basically everything that the bulb needs is is already stored. So a bulb is a giant storage unit, you know, full of energy. And so the basic parts that you just want to be aware of is down at the bottom here, this is the basal plate. So this is where all the roots come out of. This is uh, the meristematic tissue. That's where it's doing all its cell dividing um, and growth. Um, and then the bulb itself, um, this papery sheath is the tunic. It's actually a protective layer. So mm. you, you, you want that. Um, this is uh, where it's all the stored energy is. And then at the top, you'll see this is where the new growth is going to emerge from. So just know there's these three basic parts, you know, the, the basal plate, the roots, the storage portion, and then the growing tip. So when you're planting these, you always want growing end up, roots down, right? Pretty straightforward. Yes. Um, so um, basically this bulb is dormant right now, and that's when you buy them, you buy them dormant. So when you're talking about forcing, what we're doing is we're potting them up and we're letting them emerge from dormancy. So what you're gonna notice is even um, as you're buying them in the store, you might see a little bit of growth emerging from the top. That's okay, that means it's viable. You wanna make sure that your bulb is, um, it's dry, it's firm. See, there we go. So your bulb, you can see those are flower buds. Yours is about, you know, a week to two weeks ahead of mine mm -hmm. right now. So what you wanna do is you wanna start with this, you wanna pot it up. Um, you don't necessarily have to have, put it in actual garden soil, but I like to put it in a container with some soil. Um, anytime you have potting soil, the roots can still be functioning as roots. They're taking up nutrients, they're taking up water. Um, pot your bulb up, you know, scale relative to your design. I like to have just a good amount of root space uh, for your roots. I think if there's one thing to, to take home lesson is be nice to the roots. Um, they can't regrow them and that's um, where all the growth is gonna, um, hmm. taking up all its nutrients. So you really don't wanna disturb them and you wanna give them good space. Um, so just kind of potting them up like so, having them in your container. Um, your, your bulb, in the case of an amaryllis or a wintertime bulb, it can be above the soil. Um, we'll get to winter dormant bulbs. Those you, you kind of want below the soil. But you just want the roots, you want them um, in good contact with the soil, water, whatever you have. Um, and then bring them into a warm location. What you're doing is you're simulating spring. Um, right now uh -huh. it thinks it's in the summertime and it wants to stay dormant. If you pot it up, you give it water, you put it in a warm climate, you're again simulating spring. You're going to see the growth start to form at the top, you're going to start seeing it come on. And during that whole time when you see the bud forming, you'll see that big fat bud coming out, you'll see leaves coming out. Um, it's doing its process. It's doing what it wants to do. So you want to give it a couple weeks um, to start initiating that bud and to start growing. And so during that time, just keep it in a sunny window, keep it in a warm location indoors. You don't want it to get exposed to any kind of freezing temperatures. Um, and then just make sure it stays watered, um, you know, moist, um, not wet, not dry, um, and growing until that point. And then you'll start to see the uh, bud form and the flower will start to come on. So... Love that. So I know that this is another one of the varieties available at Homestead Garden. So I know that amaryllis are like a holiday treat. People love them at holidays. So how long is that period of time from when we get the bulb? Let's say we want to have it on our Christmas table. Is it too late? 
Um, it's not too late. Actually, now is about when you want to start that process. Um, and it really sort of varies from bulb to bulb. So make sure you're kind of checking in on that, like when you're, you're bulb shopping or you're looking in to kind of ask those questions because your garden center will have those answers for you. A lot of times it will have that information on the package as well. Um, so, you know, it will have that for you. So just be looking for that the days ahead. So what you'll do is say you want it to bloom on uh, Christmas Day, if that's something your your goal is. Um, so start at December the 25th and count backwards. And that will give you your start date of when you want to start um, initiating the growth on these bulbs and, and getting them going out. So And so um, if we get then, let's say I want it for February, because I know my holidays are already colorful, which is what I personally do. I like to have all of my force bulbs blooming, you know, January, February to give me that color in those dark months. Yeah, yeah. So if I get one now, can I still keep it chilled and kind of delay that process at home? Absolutely. Like I said, this, this plant is fully dormant, so you can keep it. It can stay in this state, you know, for as long as you need it to be. Now, not indefinitely, but um, certainly as long as, as, as you can, at least through the season. So yeah, um, I would just keep it in this state. They usually come in a brown paper bag. That's what I would store it in. Just a cool, dark place uh, out of freezing. You don't want it to freeze, but just a cool, dark location. Just keep it in that paper bag. And when you're ready to start, that's when you want to bring it out. Yeah. Got it. So not your refrigerator? Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. I've heard things about bulbs in refrigerators and what they, some of the gases they let off. And I have no idea about any of that, but um, I know that my basement is a great place to store bulbs because it is cool and dark. And as David said, you don't want to give them water either. So that will signal them to start growing the light, the warmth and the water. Exactly. The three kind of pieces, right? Yeah. Light, warmth, water. Yeah. And, and that applies to dry dark. To paper whites, I mean, paper whites are a similar, let's see if we can get up here a picture of those beautiful, um, let's see, paper whites. They're all similar because those are the dry ones, right? Yeah, so um, paper whites are technically a daffodil, um, uh, but they're kind of unique. Well, they're, duh, look at them. They look like a daffodil, but yeah. I did not know that they were technically a narcissus. Yeah, yeah, they, they are technically a narcissus. They're, they're a special narcissus. They're more from, they come from more of a Mediterranean um, area. Um, I believe more like Italy, um, originally Greece. Um, don't quote me on that. <laughs> we won't. But, Nobody's um, watching. <laughs> basically, um, they don't require a cold period as what a traditional daffodil will. Um, so that's, again, why they're mostly enjoyed during the winter months, because that's typically when you'll see them bloom in the wild. So we're kind of mimicking that process as well. So with paper whites, it's essentially uh, copying the same style as what you would in amaryllis um, in terms of uh, getting it potted up, initiating that growth, giving it a warm, moist environment um, to grow. So again, you're simulating spring for it. Um, but it's not going to be like your other daffodils where it needs that chilling requirement. So. Gotcha. All right. And different than our winter bulbs, you mentioned that possibly you could not pot these up in soil. You could do them in other medium like rocks or no. Oh, yeah. That's the creative part. That's the fun part. So um, have fun. I mean, that's how you kind of accessorize your bulbs, you know. Um, like I said, like with any of these bulbs, it has all the nutrients. This is a big old ball of stored energy. So it kind of has everything that it needs. Um, Produce I, that. Boom. Yeah, to do that. <laughs> like this has what it needs to do that. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be in soil. Um, you can do it in water. Like usually if you have the water line just at the roots here, you mm -hmm. know, just so that the roots can get into water, but not that you're saturating the bulb because then it can mm -hmm. start to rot. So mm -hmm. as long as you're in here, the slime ish um you can get away with doing that um again i like to put mine in actual soil because um, if you have soil you have nutrients you have water uptake your roots can function a little bit better i think no matter what you do you just want to make sure your bulb is well anchored in whatever it's in you know something that's not going to shake around something that's not going to disturb the root systems as much you know take it easy on the roots as i said Yes, I love that. A lot of people quoted you, be easy on the roots, be gentle on the roots. And Peggy Riccio just tweeted something that you said. I'm not sure which the distinction was, but thank you, Peggy, for tweeting, live tweeting us. Um, Peg, we got our first question from your and my dear friend, Peggy Ann. She is asking, and I did not know about this, David, do you give your paper whites vodka to keep them more compact? 
Um, I think you can. When I think of vodka, um, I think of that as using as more of like a sterilization tool for bulbs. Um, so that sort of reduces rot issues, potential rot issues. It reduces issues with um, um, fungus or anything that might be going on, especially if you're if, if they're in just standing water. Um, so it's an option, yes. I think you, there's a lot of different options out there when it comes to those sort of things. But again, I think it's more specific to your situation and what you um, prefer to do. Um, I'm not going to say don't do that, but I'm not going to say do that. I think it's an option, and I think that's a, ver a viable option. So Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Courtney's saying vodka? I'm in. Um, <laughs> so, And Peggy just posted a blog that she actually wrote, wrote that d does talk about something about the alcohol. But a lot of these oh, bulbs are tall. So you talk about supporting the bulb. Is that um, mainly for the roots or also because it won't flop? Both. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if your roots are supported, they're going to hold everything in place. Right. Um, so, yeah, keep that in mind that, you know, when it's it's cute and small and dormant, it's cute and small and dormant. But that's going to be a big old bloom that's going to come up. So you just have to account for that, that it is going to grow into a big, heavy, top heavy um, flower bulb. So try to keep that in mind initially, you know, have a nice sturdy container, um, both to support the root structure, but also to support that big old flower head that's going to be mm -hmm. up top. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to finally get the flower emerging and then it face plants into your couch. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, just keep that in mind. You know, it's, it's more of structural support as much as it is um, supporting the growth of the plant as well. Yeah. Got it. Now we will talk about how to overwinter or I guess over summer your bulbs, but let's talk about the winter bulbs because we've talked about amaryllis and paper whites. Mm -hmm. I would say that some are, those are some of the more traditional holiday forcing bulbs. You can get them for Thanksgiving. You can have maybe at this point it's too late for Thanksgiving. I think it's a, probably four to six weeks, right? To force at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But yeah. Christmas, you could have them for December. Um, paper whites do have a scent if you don't know. So okay. that some people, I don't get those people. I don't know those people, but you froze for a minute. I, I think we're back. Are we back? Okay, you're back. How do you okay, feel about okay. the scent of paper whites? Um, I happen to love the scent of paper whites. Me too. I associate um, the holidays and February with that smell. So, Me too. Um, you know, it's not everybody's thing, but uh, I think anytime you get fragrance, um, it's a big bonus for me. Me so. too. Totally. So um, yum. And Terry saying vintage glass stirrers are great for paper whites in gorgeous containers. Interesting. I guess it helps keep them up. I think that's what David's saying. The fun thing is there's so many ways you can store these things, put them in the hurricanes, whatever you want. Oh, yeah. And the beautiful thing is it sounds like you could pot them in anything, a teapot or, you know, whatever you want. Exactly. Yeah, that's the fun part. I mean, just like the uh, the vodka thing, um, there's a million ways to go about it and every way is right, you know, so do what's fun for you, you know. Yes. All right. So now I'm going to show you a little preview. Let's see which picture should I even show them? I don't know. Let's go ahead and pull this one up of some of the other bulbs you can force that might not be your traditional holiday, but they are your fall, traditionally fall planted bulbs. You can get now at Homestead and you can plant them where? In containers? Oh, yes. Yeah. So now's when you want to be thinking about spring. I mean, it's it's kind of a ways away, but but don't forget about it. Oh, yeah. Fall is definitely the time for bulb planting and it's definitely the time for potting up your bulbs, too. So this these are just an example. Um, this is some of my container displays in the spring. Um, around the Chanticleer house that I do uh, every year. So for all the bulbs that I planned out in the garden, um, I will pot up a bunch up in containers. And again, the process is exactly the same. So um, I will just sort of uh, collect a few handful of bulbs uh, left over from uh, planting out in the garden and I'll just put them in containers. So tulips, daffodils, um, uh, fritillaries, all kinds of things, alliums, um, they all work. Um, they all work in containers. Um, and so I'll just pot them all up and you can see I'll just set them around in the garden. I'll let them flower, do their thing. The fun thing about this is um, if you have some bulbs, uh, some tulips or things like that that aren't fully hardy um, or aren't fully perennialized, you can enjoy them in containers. You can have them up on your deck. Um, and then on the other side, um, what I like to do is I like to get a lot of uh, the bulbs that I'll buy and I'll pot them up and have them in containers. Once they have finished blooming, I'll let the, the foliage come up. I'll let the foliage senesce and die back on its own. And then I'll plant them back out into the garden later. So they're doing double duty for me. 
I know you guys don't want to see me. You just want to see this gorgeous image. Um, but I love that. I love, I've always wondered how people do bulbs in containers because I love flower bulbs. I plant them all over all kinds. I brought some allium here so I could plant allium in pots. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Like so said, talk us of... through how to do this. Absolutely. Sure. Um, so it's the process is pretty much ba uh, basically the same. So um, I have an allium here too. This one's oh, flat here. Cheers. Um, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the process is basically the same. Um, and again, you're kind of simulating um, how you would be doing it out into the garden. So any kind of container that's good for you. I tend to prefer terracotta containers um, or concrete containers. Anything that's uh, they kind of breathe a little bit. I tend to prefer them over plastics for that reason. Um, what you want to do is you have your container, um, you kind of size proportionally to the bulb or do multiple uh, per container. Um, I will fill this up with uh, just regular potting soil. Now you want something that's a little bit well drained, um, any like um, uh, water crystals or anything like that. Uh, save those for your summer containers. Um, you really want it to be moist but well drained um, when it comes to these bulbs because you don't want them to get uh, wet. They'll rot over winter otherwise. Um, I fill out my container with soil about eh, like three quarters of the way full, just over half. And then I'll lay in my bulbs um, around the pot, just kind of lay them in. Again, they have the same basic structure. Here's the basal plate at the bottom. Um, this is all storage. And then the growing tip up at the top. So the basal plate you can see is that kind of like wider area, hmm. the little tip at the top. So top, bottom. <laughs> Um, and then just kind of like place them in and you can do multiple bulbs. So with a container about this size, with this size container, you can do, yeah, you can see how much I like to cluster my bulbs together. Um, so you can do just a single one for a little dramatic effect, or you can just cluster them together. Um, I like to just kind of fill out the whole diameter or circumference of the pot, um, and then just top dress it with soil. So with uh, the bulbs, you really want these to be below soil. Um, you really don't want any of the top sticking out above the soil line. Um, you kind of want to keep them nice and snugged in. But again, you want to have them uh, towards the upper end of your pot because you want all that space down at the bottom for root growth. And so that becomes important as well. Again, be nice to the roots when we're doing this. So with any kind of things, now you can mix bulbs together. I have an allium here. I have some Tulips here, some bulbs. You can see the little papery tunic sheath here. Um, like I said, Marilyn just... is asking David if Ooh, you yeah. can force Lily of the Valley. Lily of the Valley. That's more. Um, I think of more. Think of that more as a perennial. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, it's a perfectly cold, hardy uh, plant. You'll see the growth, uh, the the leaves coming up as well. Uh, but I would treat that more uh, as a perennial. But you would essentially do it the same way. Um, fill up your pot with bulbs, line them out. I usually prefer to do a single layer. Some uh, will talk about sort of doing double layers in the container. That's definitely possible. My answer is try it, see how it works. Sometimes what happens is the bottom ones rot and the top ones grow. Um, so leave that up to the experienced or the professionals um, if you're starting out. Um, line up the bottom of the pot, fill it up with soil, I like to fill it up to the top. I'll water it in really well just to settle all the soil around the roots and get it ready for winter. And then you want to give it some sort of protection over winter time. Okay. So um, I like to put mine in cold frames. If you have cold frames, they're wonderful things for that. Um, you don't want them exposed out into the landscape uh, because these are above ground, so they, they can freeze a little bit better. Um, but you just want to give them a little bit of protection. But they don't necessarily need light or anything. They just need a cold period. So they just need to sit and rest over winter time. Think of it like that. It's kind of a resting period. So any uh, an unheated garage, a cold frame, any kind of protected location that's unheated um, is perfectly fine for that. So they're just going to stay dormant. They're just going to go through this cold treatment resting period, which of these bulbs need in order to initiate a flower bud. Um, so they can't Do you stay cover warm. them. So I've done this before with hyacinth in this beautiful big round container and then i didn't cover them and i put them in my unheated garage and some little animal i'm not sure which dug its way in so do you recommend covering the tops yes yeah good point um because yeah keep in mind again these bulbs this is all energy um tasty energy for a lot of rodents 
So um, yeah, after you have them all potted up, they're ready to go. Yeah, you do want to cover them in some sort. Um, I like to put wire, um, just kind of form it over the top of the pot. Um, here at Chanticleer, we've used um, uh, the uh, fire pit grates where we've just sort of cloaked yeah. them with a yeah. grate. Um, anything like that. Um, so yeah, anything that's uh, sort of small enough to for gas exchange for air to get through, but um, tight enough that rodents can't get into it because you will have that problem over winter um, if you don't protect them in some way. So, yes. <laughs> and um, we've got people talking about a pot, Terry, a pot full of spring blooming bulbs helps with looking forward to spring. So I think that's one of the great things about fall bulbs is it is that first sign of spring, but now you get to have them in pots. So cool. And you could give these as gifts to Absolutely. people, I mean, which I think would be lovely. All right, so, but you're still talking about the process. So you have to water them through winter, I guess. Um, through winter, you wanna keep them on the drier side. Like I said, initially I like to pot them up and just water them really well. And then I will actually just let it be for the rest of the season. Now you don't want your pot to dry out, but you don't want it sitting wet either. So just kind of check in on it every once in a while. Um, if you feel like it's getting a little dry on top, you can just give it a little bit of water. But just bear in mind that um, a wet pot causes rot. So um, you, want to, you want them to stay on the drier side. Now, when you start to see growth forming, when it's warming up in the spring, you know, the great anticipation, especially when you're doing this in the fall, um, uh, when you start seeing growth forming, that's when you want to take them outside um, and put them into the light and give them like give them water because now the growth is happening. So you want to be supporting that. So, yeah. So do we bring them in full sun or is it just whatever the bulb, I guess, whatever the particular bulb we planted? I guess bulbs like, most bulbs like kind of part sun, most sun. Yeah, yeah. Um, they prefer full sun, but any kind of part sun is fine. Any kind of light, you know. Yeah. Um, so Warm. I will try to bring them into as much sun as I can um, in the springtime. Bear in mind, if you feel like they're growing too fast, if you have a target date in the spring that you want them to bloom, um, you can put them more into the shade, into a cooler location, and that'll slow them down a little bit. Because once they get that spring sun, they just want to go, 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 go. You know? Me Don't too. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, so, that yeah. seems so much easier than I thought it was. And now it just yeah. seems like all these containers I have lying around, I want to go grab up all the last of the fall bulbs that I can and put them in pots. Because it's also, I mean, I I love digging my fall bulbs. I use something called an auger. It's a power planter. Oh, yeah. I pop them in the ground. I'm sure you guys have methods that are quick as well. I love them in the ground. But fall bulbs and pots, as Terry said, it is a pot full of hope. It's that anticipation of spring and it's a little bit fancy. Like it's a little bit of Chanticleer at home. Um, yeah. It's a little fancy. I mean, look at this. I'm gonna hide so you guys can. Oh, yeah, there we are. So actually fritillaries and hyacinths are some of my favorite things to have in containers. Um, fritillaries are these dainty meleagris, the dainty little things with these checker patterns. Hyacinths, super fragrant. And when you put them in a container, you're putting them up right at nose height. So um, some of my favorites there to do. So I did this in the fall. This is what you get in the spring. That is stunning. I mean, that is so beautiful. Right. And as Peggy and echoed, it would be such a great gift for somebody. And so, okay, so we've got the, we've done the work now. Come spring, these might not live in pots all summer. Can you, you mentioned a little bit earlier, you can take them and dig them up and actually put them back in the ground. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, with any of these bulbs, um, they're all fully, for the most part, hardy bulbs. So what you can do is just um, just keep them in the container. Once they finish flowering, I'll deadhead them. I'll leave them growing. Um, and once they start to, to go dormant, the, the foliage starts to dry up, I'll wait until they're fully dormant again, you know, about late spring, early summer. And then I'll just plant them back out into the landscape. And then they're just part of my landscape rotation, so. Yeah, Wonderful. you can accessorize with them however you want and then move them out into the garden uh, however. I love it. You know. Yes, so, and yeah. Peggy, I made a great point, and so did Terry, that you can bring these in and have them on the table when we are all entertaining again and you have Easter dinner at your house um, or you want to decorate your table with any kind of arrangements. These are the kinds of exactly. things that you could do now to prepare for then. And as David said, now is our garden planning time. You know, it's starting to get, here we're getting a little Zeta. Are you getting the wind of Zeta at Chanticleer? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little windy. It was a little cold this weekend. And so we're starting that planning process. So plan these fall forced bulbs in your garden for spring. I love it. 
Yeah, a lot of fun, and, a lot of anticipation, and oh yeah, just um, great gifts. Uh, I just love accessorizing with them. You can bring them inside, you can stack them, you can have arrangements of them, you can switch them out, move them, combine them with other fun spring things. Um, that's what I love about containers, it's just the versatility of them. You can just use them anywhere you want yes. so, and move them around. So love it. have fun with it. Containers are fun, yeah. And then, so with, we talked about the amaryllis and the paper whites before. So what about storing these? I know that my dad has about 15 amaryllis that he will save over the summer um, and bring them back, you know, force the dormancy. So we can do that with these as well, right? Absolutely. Um, and so what I was saying about that uh, dry dormant versus winter dormant is, you know, these are bulbs that are native to South Africa. So their environment, um, they go dry dormant during the summertime and during the rainy, their winter, which is very rainy, that's when they're initiating growth. So with these, again, you want to, after the flower and you see the foliage coming up through, um, you just want to let it uh, complete its life cycle. So let it keep that foliage growing. You want to keep watering it. Um, you can uh, fertilize it at that point because it's starting to put its energy from its leaves back down into the bulb. So it's starting to form this again um, to get ready for next year. So let it complete its life cycle, let it start to go dormant on its own, and then stop watering it. Um, that's the nice thing about um, these types of bulbs is um, they just want to go dry and dormant. So stop watering them. I let mine go bone dry. Um, I keep them in their container. I'll just bring the container in. I'll put it in a dark, cool location and just forget about it until next year. Um, simple as that. <laughs> I love it. And then back that date out because I know sometimes Amaryllis, you know, the ones at Homestead are sixteen ninety nine. There's some varying prices between like ten and twenty. I mean, I've seen some much more expensive than that. Um, yeah. And so you can save them and then you can collect mm -hmm. and have a whole tablescape of amaryllis. You can save them year over year. So that's a great tip to oh, be yeah. able it's to do that. Slope. You just keep yeah. wanting to collect more and more, you know, it happens and I totally support it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we are full thumbs up on collecting bulbs for forcing. We love that. That's a very good hobby to have. Mm. Yeah. Do try it out. And if you see me in the springtime with all my containers, come ask me questions and let's talk about it. Let's talk about bulbs and containers. Yes, I can't wait. I sadly did not get to Chanticleer this year. It was such a strange year. Um, but next year, when we are all visiting, everyone from Homestead or whomever is watching and visiting, make sure you add Chanticleer to your list to visit. Um, and of course, Homestead. So, oh my gosh, this has been wonderful. Peggy, still live tweeting us. Thank you. I think we got, let's just do a quick flip through all of these gorgeous images again so you guys can see them. I'm gonna hide myself because, I'm gonna hide David and my, no, I'll do that at the end, David. So we're done and wrapped up, but we can show everybody all of the beautiful work that you've done at Chanticleer. It's just a little bit of the work he's done. He was like, I could send you like 5,000 pictures. No, he didn't yeah. say that, but <laughs> there's a lot of beautiful things you can do. Think about the compliments. Someone, um, Lisa said it's a beautiful arrangement. I think you want to think about it kind of making a floral arrangement in a pot mm -hmm. with your bulbs. Mm -hmm. what, what colors go well together? Maybe some varying heights, right? So oh, yeah. mix it yeah. up, have fun. The nice thing about all these little containers is you can mix and match. If something's yes. not working, pop it out, switch it out. Easy Love as it. That. Yeah. So nice. And we want to thank flowerbulbs.com, which is a great resource. It's an educational resource for you to find out all you want to know about flower bulbs, everything you want to know. Um, David told us today, but if you want to know more, then go to flowerbulbs.com and you can learn more about fall bulbs, forcing bulbs for the winter, spring planted bulbs. We've got bulbs that you could plant all year long. So that's really fun. I'm a huge fan of fall bulbs um, and, and dahlias, you know, and, and our spring planted bulbs as well. So big fan here. So thank you flowerbulbs.com and thank you Homestead, especially all of our Garden Rewards members. This little mini series of these Grow with Katie at Homestead have been thanks in part to our Garden Rewards members. Please become a member so we can do more of these um, because this is our last one for 2020. You're our, this is the happy new year for all of us. This is mm -hmm. it. We're wrapping it up. Um, we do have a great lineup for 2021. So um We'll be back for Houseplant, National Houseplant Month in January, David. We've got some great houseplant people. We've got um, Summer Rain from Homestead Brooklyn, Daryl Chang from Houseplant Journal, and Hilton Carter. So I'm really excited about that lineup for January. Check it out on the Facebook page. You can RSVP now so you don't forget. But David, we'll let you go back to work. <laughs>
<laughs> thank well. you. Thank you so much. Everyone saying thank you. It was really lovely. It's really gotten me in that holiday spirit and spring spirit all at once. So it's been really fun. Yeah, thank you for your time today. See you all in spring. Yeah. Yes. Thanks we again. can't wait. All right. I'm going to play you a little bit of his slideshow of his lovely images. And thank you all for tuning in and have a lovely rest of your holiday season. Bye, David. Bye, Bye everybody.